Hi everybody and welcome back to my lecture series on hardware for deep learning. I'm Dr. Adam Tiemann of Enix Labs at Bar Ilan University and today we'll be going over part 4 which I call reducing the complexity. This lecture has five parts starting with motivation for reducing the complexity then we'll go over a bunch of ways that it's done starting with lightweight models, reducing precision, aggressive quantization and finally pruning and deep compression. So let's start with the motivation. Well as we've discussed in the previous lectures models keep getting larger. If we take the left side here, we see um, some uh, data from Microsoft about image recognition. It's a, a bit old, back in 2016, but this is a, a, a common trend. So we see that AlexNet was eight layers, had 1.4 gigaflops, and about a 16% error. To reduce the error, um, ResNet came out in 2015. It already had 152 layers, 22.6 gigaflops, to provide this 3.5% error. That's a 16x increase in the model size. Um, for other tasks such as speech recognition, we can see this data from Baidu. And between Deep Speech 1 and Deep Speech, uh, Deep Speech 2, we had a 10x um, uh, increase in the training operations needed. And there's an explosion in size, complexity, and energy. Here we have some data, for a nice graph from Qualcomm that I really liked, where we see this increase in the number of parameters in the neural nets uh, given by Qualcomm. Um, so uh, we can also see over here the model size of different models that have come uh, throughout the years, the size in megabytes and the gigaflops needed. We'll be discussing some of these ways down here to reduce this model size um, and reduce the number of operations. Song Han puts out three big challenges in, uh, in neural networks. The first challenge is the model size. One of the reasons for, for this challenge, it's really hard to distribute large models through over-the-air updates. So if we have over here the app store that needs to update uh, applications, we have some sort of a limit usually on what uh, is allowed to be updated. And on the right over here, we have like uh, our autonomous cars that are going to be coming out. And if Tesla or another uh, autonomous car or self-driving uh, assistance uh, um, operate, um, producer is going to uh, transfer a new updated model, um, it has to be done fast, it has to be done with a small model. The second challenge could be speed. So one, one thing for speed is the, the long training times. They limit the machine learning researcher's productivity. You can see um, here um, what, uh, again, Song Han ran, um, training different ResNet sizes to get different error rates and how long it took. Okay, this was done on uh, uh, using uh, Torch, using uh, four M40 GPUs. Um, there are different ways have made this shorter in the in the rec in the recent past, but uh, again, this is a long thing. The more complex the model, the longer training time takes. Of course, we have uh, uh, things with uh, with inference on the edge where we want real time or very fast updates. So speed is a big challenge. And the third challenge, which um, is not always taken into uh, uh, effect, is uh, energy efficiency. So if we look at the, the high-end side, we can take the AlphaGo project um, by Google, where uh, a machine was able to beat the best Go players in the world. And it took um, almost 2,000 CPUs and almost 300 GPUs to run AlphaGo, which means that for one game of Go, it was a $3,000 electric bill. Um, but if you go over to, again, the mobile to the edge, um, if, if we're taking up a lot of energy by doing this inference, we're going to be draining the battery. And in data center, it increases the total cost of ownership when we're using so much power. So these are the big three challenges, model size, speed, and energy efficiency. If we look at the energy, well, where is the energy consumed? If we have a larger model, it means we need more memory references, and this is going to be taking up more energy. We can see um, a well-known uh, statistics about how much uh, different operations cost from a 32-bit uh, uh, integer add um, down to like a 32-bit multiplication uh, um, flo uh, floating point multiplication and we see that there's a huge increase in energy but nothing compares to an access to DRAM which uh, is several orders of magnitude uh, larger um, in, in cost. So how are we going to make our models more energy efficient and we're going to discuss that among the other challenges in, uh, in this lecture. So the first thing we're going to go to is lightweight models. So just a reminder of what we've discussed before. How is a standard convolution carried out? And we're also going to show some terminology or nomenclature for the different types of, uh, of parameters we're going to have here. So for layer sizes, we have our input, um, our input feature map. And our input feature map is going to be size H by W. And the depth or the number of channels is going to be C. And we're going to be drawing our um, filters according to Vivian Z's uh, way of doing it in blue. 
Okay, the filter size um, is going to be R, R times S, so we have uh, R times S um, in a, in a one-dimensional kernel, and there are going to be C channels. C has to be uh, similar to the uh, number of input channels. And the output, well, depending on the number of filters we have, each filter is going to give us one output uh, feature map. So the feature maps are going to be sized E by F. And uh, if we have M filters or we want M output channels, uh, we're going to have M filters to provide us M output channels. So the size, the depth, the channel depth of the output map is going to be M. Okay, so those are the feature sizes. Again, filters are going to be green, inputs are going to be blue, and outputs are going to be red in uh, most of these slides. Um, just to simplify this a bit so we don't have so many letters, we're going to assume square inputs and square filters. So instead of saying uh, H by W, we're just going to use H square as the size of the inputs um, with C channels. For the filters, instead of saying R by S, we're just going to say K squared for the kernel, uh, the, the um, square kernel size. And of course, it's going to be C channels. And for the output, we're going to assume the output uh, feature maps are the same size as the input feature maps. Um, so they're going to be H squared as well with uh, um, a depth of n. Of course, the general uh, way is looking with the EF and HW and RS, but just for simplification, so we don't get mixed up with so many letters, we're just going to assume this squares and uh, the input and output being the same size. Taking that, the cost of a convolution, um, if we have M output maps, which are each H squared, so for each one of the uh, little uh, features here inside the output, what we're going to need is to take um, one of these uh, filters, uh, k squared times an area of k squared on the input, and we're going to have to do that um, for all c uh, two-dimensional filters on the two-dimensional input. So we need k squared by c uh, MAC operations in order to um, achieve one of these outputs. We need um, we need uh, h squared of these outputs. So that's going to give us uh, h squared by k squared. Uh, by C for each one of these two-dimensional feature maps at the output and their total of M of them. So we get a total number of max M times H squared times K squared times C. The number of weights is of course the number of um, values that we have inside the feature layer. So we have M filters. Each filter is a depth of C and a size of K squared for each two-dimensional filter. So we get M times K squared times C weights. So Pay attention that this is the proportional to the number of input channels, which is C. It's proportional to the kernel size, K2. It's proportional to the output si uh, map size, which is H squared. And it's proportional to the uh, number of output channels, M. So if we can reduce any of these or several of them, it's going to reduce the number of max and the number of weights that we have. Um, another thing that I want to bring up before we start is spatial and channel connectivity. So there's this nice visualization um, with these illustrations that if we take, uh, for example, a three by three kernel, we can look at the spatial dimension or one row of how uh, we have connectivity. And we want to see the connectivity between the input activations and the output feature maps. And we can see that each one of these like uh, inputs is connected to um, to three outputs. And so we get this kind of uh, connectivity, which is quite extensive, but it's nothing compared to our um, uh, to our channel connectivity. So if we look uh, across channels, each input channel is connected to each uh, output channel in like a fully connected type of a of a web here. Okay. Um, so these are brought by these types of illustrations are brought by Yusuke Uchida, and I really like them and I bring them for several of, of uh, the different um, approaches we have here. If you go to his uh, uh, blog on um, towards data science, you can see his uh, uh, these illustrations for all the different types of uh, models that have been or the popular models that have been proposed in recent years. OK, so for convolutions, what we can see here is especially the inputs and outputs are connected locally. This is this kind of local um, perception type thing that we have. And that's why we have this uh, more sparse connectivity. But for channels, the input and outputs are fully connected. And uh, again, if we can reduce some of this connectivity um, while uh, keeping, again, accuracy, then we're going to have uh, fewer operations and it's going to be easier. So the first approach that I'm going to show is called group convolutions. And the reason I'm showing it first, I think it was the first one that was ever demonstrated. So um, again, the observation here is that the more filters in the layer or the, uh, the, the, the number of output channels, which is M, um, it means that we learn more intermediate features. So one way of looking at this, and again, it's kind of hand-waving here, but we like to explain how things learn 
um, learn features. Each filter will kind of learn uh, uh, different features. So the more features we have, the more um, feature, the more filters we have, the more features we're going to learn. So we want a high number of m. But the problem is that this leads to a lot of operations. So remember that the total max was uh, m times h square k square c square. So the more uh, the larger the m is, the more uh, total operations we're going to have. So instead, we can use an approach that's called group convolution. This is reducing the number of operations by dividing the input into several groups. Essentially, we can learn different features through different uh, routes. And this was shown uh, first in AlexNet. So when you see in AlexNet, there's a, this route and this route. And we actually have the uh, different uh, channels are going through different routes to, to the output. And this was done uh, in AlexNet to, to be able to split the training onto two GPUs that could only um, deal with about half of the depth that uh, they wanted to use at once. But you'll see that this is used uh, for other reasons to, to reduce complexity. So let's look at uh, the mechanics of the group convolutions. We have now G groups. This is a new parameter. Um, and uh, so again, what we're going to do is we're going to divide our filters and our outputs into G different groups. Okay, so uh, what we do is we take our filters, we have a total of M filters, remember, and since we have G groups of filters, so in each group, we're going to have M divided by uh, G filters. So each of these groups is M divided by G filters. Okay, um, and then each of these uh, groups is going to be connected to one um, set of output F maps. So um, so what we're going to do is going to take this, uh, the filters of depth C over G, and that's going to be um, applied to only C over G depth in the input, and that's going to be, uh, uh, that's going to provide us with uh, one uh, of these output maps. And again, since we have M over G of these, we're going to get a total depth of M over G, but the connectivity is again through only the first layer here, uh, the first uh, C over G layers here. Okay, then the next... Um, filters, the next C over G filters are going to be applied to this C over G group of uh, input channels here. And we're going to go through here to get this guy. And again, uh, the third one over here, just showing three is going to be provided to this. And in the end, we're going to concatenate all of these we have a total of G output uh, feature maps. So what does this give then give us our total number of max is we have G times M over G H squared times K squared times C over G, which is the depth of the filters. And if you see that we have uh, this G may uh, uh, cross out with this G, but we have another d division by G in the whole thing. So we get a total reduction of one over G in the number of max that we need. So the more groups that we divide to the larger reduction in the number of max we need. Now, of course, uh, we have this uh, different type of connectivity because beforehand, each of these input um, channels was going through all of these um, filters to all of these output channels. And now we're only taking a portion of them, which is each going through its separate route. So we get less connectivity, um, but this has been shown that it, in some cases it can provide uh, good accuracy. So again, if we look at this spatial visualization and the channel visualization, our spatial visualization is the same. We have the same local connectivity um, between the inputs and the outputs, but in within channels, we only um, maintain the connectivity per group. So there is no connection between um, one group and the next group, we don't have this fully connected type of thing, and this reduces the complexity a lot. So taking that um, kind of uh, idea of how we can reduce the connectivity and the number of connections, there's a, a more extreme type of uh, uh, approach, which is called pointwise convolution or one by one convolution. And this has become very popular. So this looks at a different problem. Um, convolving a large filter over many input channels is expensive. So if we have a really large filter with a large K squared, okay, and we have many input channels C, the number of uh, both uh, the, the number of both weights and, um, and MAC operations is going to be large because we have this K squared times C. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to merge some of the channels, reduce the number of C before we go and multiply by a large window. In the large window, we want to maintain it in some cases to have a larger like uh, perception area. Okay, so before we use a larger window, what we're going to do is we're going to try to reduce the number of uh, channels that we have to convolve by. 
Okay, so how do we do this? We use a one by one filter. So the size or a point wise convolution, the size of the filter is going to be one by one uh, on a two dimensional kernel, but we're going to have C of these two multiply by the inputs. So in the case over here, we have a uh, feature uh, input feature maps of size uh, eight by eight, um, and there's a depth of three. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a one by one by uh, three filter and we're going to convolve over it. That's going to provide us uh, the same size output, which is going to be eight by eight. But um, all these three channels are going to be merged into one output. Okay. So if we want to get a desired change of the size of the output depth, what we just need is to have M filters of, uh, uh, of this size. Okay. So the total cost uh, is going to be M uh, times H squared by C, which is the, each one of these needs H squared by C um, multiplications or max. And then we need M of these to do this. Um, what this does is it kind of bend, blends the information across channels. So in a spatial way, all we have is each input goes directly to one output. So this window goes over here and then it moves over and goes over here and moves over and goes over here. Each window just multiplies by one pixel. This pixel goes directly into this uh, pixel. This pixel goes directly into this pixel again across the, the channel. But since since we do this uh, cross channel thing, we're going to still have this full connectivity of the channel. So uh, this one pixel is a blend of this and this and this. OK. So that's kind of uh, the connectivity of this thing. So where was this used? It was, uh, I think, originally um, provided, uh, proposed by uh, inception layers in GoogleNet. OK, and GoogleNet it, it, in general wanted to solve three problems. First of all, that previous models kept going deeper, which was very computationally expensive. The second thing is there is a, a bit large variation in the location of information. So if we see we have these three dogs, which are of the same category, but the size of the dog, the size of his nose, the size of his eyes and ears changes a lot between these three pictures, even the direction that it's looking at. So we need we want to have many different types of filters and sizes of perception to actually categorize and uh, and adhere to each one of these pictures. OK. Um, and the third thing is that if we make our neural networks too deep, and this may have been shown in like the deep, deep ResNets, that we have some overfitting that can happen. Okay, so Google said, instead of going deeper, let's try to go wider. And how the, and this is called an inception layer. And we have the previous layer, instead of just going straight deep through the network, we split it into several, um, several different sizes of convolution. So you can see that here there's a one by one convolution, three by three, five by five, and even a three by three max pooling. So we have different types of perception that are done in this inception layer before we concatenate everything together. OK, and this uh, is really nice, except for the uh, problem, as we said before, a three by three convolution or a five by five convolution. If we have many, many input channels, they're going to be very expensive. OK, so instead of that, what we do is before we actually do these larger convolutions, we're going to put a layer of one by one convolutions on top of it to reduce the number of channels that we get and have to run the larger um, convolution windows on them. OK, so that's what the one by one convolutions um, were used for here. SqueezeNet took this to another level where instead of an inception layer, they call their type of layer a fire module. OK, um, uh, so again, what they do here is they use one by one convolutions to reduce the channel depth. So we have our input. We have this squeeze layer, which is going to have uh, a, a, instead of a depth of 64, which we added the input, we're going to squeeze all that down to a depth of 16. Then we're going to break it into two um, into two paths. One is a, a, an expand layer of one by one convolutions, which is going to expand back to 64. And the other is an expand layer of three by three convolutions, and they're going to be 64 of these filters. So altogether, we get 64 filters over here and 64 filters over here. So when we concatenate them, them together, we get an output that has a depth of 128. But the overall number of parameters and uh, the complexity in terms of max is going to be much lower than if done, uh, doing it on uh, um, all the filter on 128 filters uh, altogether, the, the maximum size with the input of 64, uh, depth of 64. OK, there are two other interesting concepts in SqueezeNet besides this uh, pointwise type convolution um, and this uh, squeezing and expanding. One of them is downsampling. So SqueezeNet actually uses a, a lower than one stride, so a stride of a, a half late in the network. What this does is it it makes our um, our later layers become our later feature maps become larger, actually. And um, then we have uh, uh, many parameters in the later convolutional layers, and they show that this is better for categorization. And another thing is that fully connected layers, which we showed before, had a lot of the weights. They don't have any data reuse. They're very expensive for 
for calculation. Instead of using fully connected layers, they got rid of them and instead use um, some sort of a classification with like average pooling. So if we use average pooling and we have um, n channels for n classification categories without any weights, we can actually go and do our classification. And this is much uh, cheaper um, than, than doing it with a, a traditional fully connected layer. Okay, so that was point-wise convolution, and bringing together group convolutions and point-wise convolutions, we get to what's called a depth-wise convolution. Okay, so this is actually a combination of group convolutions and point-wise convolution, and let's start by looking at standard convolution. So if we have an input of H by W by C, and we want to arrive at an output of E by F by M, that's kind of what we've always been doing. What we need is um, we need M filters to provide these M outputs, and the depth of each of these filters needs to be C because we have a, an input depth of C. Okay, so this is what we, we did traditionally. Let's say we had an input of 7 by 7 by 3, um, and we wanted an output of 5 by 5 by 128. So um, we use a 3 by 3 filter that uh, reduces the size of the input from 7 by 7 to 5 by 5. Okay, that's just a 3 by 3 filter, and since we have three um, input channels, we need a depth of three of the filters, and since we need, we want 128 output channels, we need 128 of these filters. If we calculate the number of max, we need 86,000 max, and if we calculate the number of weights, we need uh, 3,500 weights for doing this. So that's uh, the, the traditional way of doing this. Depthwise convolution says let's reduce this um, uh, in, in, a, in a strange way, and it's been shown to actually provide a similar number of uh, a similar accuracy. So, in some cases at least. Okay, so instead, what we're going to do is we're going to do a group convolution with C groups. So that's uh, the maximum number, basically, of groups we can do. So we have C, K by K by one filter. Each uh, filter is applied to one input channel and provides one output map. And then concatenating these together, we get an output of E by F by C. Okay, so let's look at that in our example. So we have our 7 by 7 by 3 input. And um, we what we're going to do is we're going to, again, um, take uh, uh, um, k by k by one filters, right? So we're going to have these three by three filters, which are going to reduce the size from seven by seven to five by five, five by five. But instead of having a depth three, each of these is going to have a depth one. So this filter, the orange filter, is going to uh, multiply only by the first channel over here and provide us with the first channel of the output map. Uh, the second channel. Uh, the second filter is going to uh, multiply by the second um, channel of the input and give us the second channel of the output. And the third filter is going to multiply by the third channel of the input and provide us the third channel of the output. So this is really an extreme group convolution where we actually have this one by one connectivity between input channels and output channels. So um, what we get is a five by five by three output. Okay, so but that's not the output we wanted. Again, we wanted five by five by 128. To do that, we just use an expand with a pointwise one by one convolution. So now we need M filters, which in our uh, case is going to be 128, which are one by one by C, um, C being three in this case. So it provides the uh, desired output. So let's see that again in, in our example. So now our input is this five by five by three um, um, in intermediate group that we made. Now we're going to have these one by one by three um, filters, but we're going to have 128 of them. And so um, Providing these one by one by three filters, we're going to get 128 uh, output channels, and the size is going to be kept the same, five by five. So we're going to have five by five by 128, and that was what we originally wanted to do. So we took our seven by seven by three um, inputs, and we um, we ran our convolutions and got to a five by five by 128 output with a different type of connectivity. But um, again, we have this type of uh, mixing and matching of both the, the locality through these uh, these these convolutions and the uh, channel mix up uh, by these pointwise convolutions and um, what we can see though it provides us uh, 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 the same type of operation but it has a way fewer number of max so we have a reduction of about 80 percent of the max and uh, uh, about 90 percent of the weights so it's a really cheap way and it's been shown to provide a similar type of accuracy so this is called depthwise convolution and it became very popular in mobile net so this is a, a very highly reduced um, neural network that was introduced by Google in 2017. Um, 
it actually applies uh, batch normalization in ReLU after each depthwise convolution. So basically, the three by three depthwise convolution, which is kind of this uh, uh, this C number of groups, is done. Then they run batch normalization in ReLU. Then they run the one by one convolution expansions. Again, run batch normalization in ReLU. So one of these guys is your basic module that repeats itself many times. So it, it arrives at better accuracy than VGG16, though it has 97% fewer weights and 97% fewer max, and that's, uh, that's pretty nice. Okay, so MobileNet is one of these very um, uh, popular reduced size networks. Uh, another kind of uh, um, uh, 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 alternative to MobileNet is ShuffleNet, and ShuffleNet does a, a similar thing. So it also does this type of group convolution, this extreme group convolution, but instead of actually uh, just passing the groups directly from the input channel one to output channel one, it shuffles them up. So the output is this weird shuffling type of a thing, and that has also been shown to be really nice. It also uses uh, standard depth light convolu convolutions, and it uses uh, residual passes like in ResNet, um, and concatenates all them together. So this is the type of a module that's used. So we have these one by one group convolutions then we uh, do batch normalization in ReLU we, sh we shuffle the channels up then we do a three by three depth wise convolution uh, batch normalization again we do this expand with the one by one um, group convolution or the one by one convolutions we do batch normalization and uh, all that is passed to the output plus we take the, the standard input we bypass it with this residual connection add it all together run ReLU and that's the type of a layer and that's again another cheap um, type of a uh, low MAC and low weight type of a, a layer that um, gives good accuracy and it even has been shown to outperform mobile net. The last uh, type of uh, reduction scheme that we're going to talk about is factorized or stacked convolutions. Okay, And how we're going to do this is we're going to reduce the number of weights using two smaller filters. So in VGG, um, we wanted to have a five by five filter for the space for the locality of it so the five by five filter that has 25 weights in it so instead of actually using one five by five filter needing 25 weights what we, we what they do is they take a three by three filter which has nine weights they run a convolution with the three by three filter and the three by three filter provides us with a three by three output after running it on a five by five um, input and then we have another three by three filter which is just a, a put over on in one place on this three by three output and it provides us with one output so again our original convolution we wanted to run a five by five filter on an area of five by five in the input to provide one output here we do it in two steps uh, first we use a three by three filter that provides a three by three output then another three by three filter which uh, produces the single output um, but two three by three filters are a total of 18 weights while one five by five filter filter needed 25 weights so it's a reduction in the number of weights inception version two also did this they do it in kind of a, uh, a vectorized type of a way where we use um, uh, one by n filters and n by one filters so it's a total of two n weights that are needed and that can replace an n by n filter which is n square weights and that can be a large reduction so just for example here if we have a uh, three by three we want to implement the three by three filter which needs nine weights we take first a um, one by n filter which is run by convolution here here and here provides us a, a uh, um, an n by one output then we have an n by one filter which we run one time and it prov pro provides the single output so we have six weights that replace the nine weight filter so that's another uh, type of a way of doing this so th what what we discussed here are different ways that um, popular models have reduced the um, the complexity the number of max and the number of weights in our convolutional layers and that has been applied for uh, several very popular um, networks that have shown to uh, provide good accuracy on common uh, on common uh, uh, um, data sets, and they're very popular nowadays.